Hello and welcome to the UK Ed podcast from UK Ed Charts. I'm Colin and in this episode we'll be looking at research done at the University of Kent that explores specific reasons for different types of pupil withdrawal in the classroom. Also, following on from a recent UK Ed Chat discussion, our regular commentator Richard Rogers shares his experiences of differentiation. So we'll get going with the research undertaken at the University of Kent. The study hopes to help teachers identify specific types of pupil withdrawal in the classroom. The research, published in the journal Learning and Instruction, discovered that psychological pressure from teachers can contribute to disengaged behaviours from teenage students under the age of 14. Active disengagement behaviours include talking. Active disengagement behaviours include talking and making noise, with daydreaming in class among the more passive disengagement behaviours. I'm joined now by lead researcher Dr Stephen Earle from the University of Kent's School of Sport and Exercise Sciences. Stephen, welcome to the show. Please tell us a little bit about the research and the findings that were concluded. I think thank you for having me. Um, the the main aim of the the research was to look at and try and help avoid disengagement in in school classrooms, um, and specifically, the the study sort of developed from me being in classrooms and just sort of seeing that certain certain students would disengage in a passive way, sort of withdraw themselves in the classroom where some others might mess around, chat. Um, distract themselves or others and so there was kind of two different types of disengagement appear the research team here and what we specifically found was that uh, teenagers that felt incapable that felt like they were a failure in the classroom and couldn't do the work they reported less energy and would become passively disengaged so it was kind of like I can't do this work I'm not very good at this and I'm going to withdraw myself in a passive way and switch off, daydream, not want to answer any questions. Whereas teenagers that felt forced to do activities, they didn't know why they were doing um, an activity or they were just being told to do it and you know they didn't necessarily want to do it. Um, they didn't report any reductions in energy, but they were rated by the teachers as disengaging either actively, so they would mess around, fidget, talk to talk to their friends, talk to the other uh, peers in the classroom, or they might switch off in a passive way. Um, and that kind of show, it's kind of a, a different process in that they're not, redu- they haven't got reduced energy, but they're, they're withdrawing themselves in, in different ways. And the sort of key part for teachers of the study was that that was kind of those processes were found to come from uh, the use of psychological pressure in the classroom. Um, And all teachers want the best for their students, want to engage their students as best they can. And often when they're faced with with students that maybe are disengaged or unmotivated or are messing around, um, it's very easy to sort of use the threats of punishment, use guilt to try and get them to do the work or just tell them, do this because I say so. And that's very much a, um, a psychological pressure. I've used psychological control in the paper, and that doesn't mean control of the classroom in terms of being the authority, authoritative figure. It just psychological control refers to more, you know, psych- pressure and um, sort of manipulating pupils to try and pressure and um, sort of manipulating pupils to try and get them to do the work and and it's always the best intentions from teachers but the study kind of shows that actually by using those strategies we might actually be disengaging the, the, the teenagers more in the classroom. So can, can you give us an idea of the typical psychological controlling strategies that, that you witness that teachers may be using with the teenage students and what the possible consequences of this are? Yeah so uh, as I said earlier it was um, the the psychological pressure is it's it's using things like uh, you know threats of punishment so do this or you'll you'll get detention or um, you know everyone should be able to do this work this is easy it's kind of putting a little bit of guilt on towards the the, the students that think well oh I should be able to do this or getting them uh, teachers telling the students you know do this because I say so but not really explain to the students why they're doing that activity or what the relevant activity so that the the students themselves can can see, oh, this is why we're doing this. Okay, I want to do this. It's not just being told to do it without any rationale behind it. And the majority of, you know, 
majority of teachers will, will, will never use the, with the, these strategies, but you know, there's a lot of pressure on teachers. They've got a lot of uh, pupils in the classroom. They've got the curriculum to get through, time pressures. And this is just sort of to identify that even under all them pressures, it's important that teachers are aware of these sort of pressurizing tactics that even if they're not aware they're doing them or using them, they could have a negative impact on, on the students. And it's sort of taking a, a student perspective a bit more than being focused more on what the teacher's doing in terms of well, what am I, what content am I giving, um, what, you know, what, what's the organization of my session just trying to flip that a little bit and think well what are the what are the students taking from that how are they feeling um and you know if they're disengaged what what might be causing that because from a i always say you can you can always observe a classroom and you can observe what the teacher's doing and you can observe what the pupils are doing and how they're behaving but there's like an invisible link between those those teacher interactions and the pupil behavior and this study with this, the sort of psychological experiences of, you know, ability and um, feeling forced to do things. Uh, I also look at motivation a lot as well. And that's kind of the invisible link between what's the inputs in a classroom and the outputs. And that's kind of what the, what the study is really about is trying to just look at the, the, and the, the things you can't quite observe, but the psychological experiences that students have will influence how they behave. Mm, excellent. I was, I was talked by the discussion element of the study, and you actually demonstrate that pupils who perceive that they do not have the ability to be successful in the classroom may actually withdraw passively from the learning activities in an attempt to hide their own perceived incompetence, to hide their own perceived incompetencies and, and avoid failure. You say that pupils may attempt to avoid attention by becoming unwilling to answer questions, um, offer their opinion or attempt difficult tasks. So in your opinion, how easy is it for teachers to identify these pupils and what steps can they take to re reverse the situation? Yeah, I mean, that's an excellent point. I think that's one of the the key things from this is that uh, pupils that mess around and, and are a bit more actively disruptive in the classroom, they're the ones that are very easy to, to kind of identify or they're, they're disengaged. But actually, it's the, the passive students that are the ones that can potentially sometimes go under the radar a little bit. And, you know, they get set, pupils get set a task and, you know, the, they're not really engaged with it. They're sort of withdrawn from it, but it's, it's not that obvious to, to see. And this is one of the things about this study that I really want to kind of bring to the to the forefront is that you know it, that these pupils might be for a um, and for a spe specific reason. So it could be, it's not just that they're bored or they don't want to be there. It might be that they're actually really struggling with the work, and that if teachers are aware of that, they can maybe just preempt that and, and think right. Well, are you struggling with the work or anything, and 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 help them along that way. So the I think one of the key things for the study for me is really bringing the the student experience to the forefront of the, of the, within classrooms in that they are, they might be difficult to to spot passive disengaged students teach to spot passive disengaged students but it is um you know if we can help teachers be more aware of that and maybe do some inter, you know interventions or uh, workshops where teachers have provided scenarios where oh, you've, you've, you're facing this, you know, you've, you're dealing with this disengaged student. What do you think might cause this? How might you respond to that? Um, and, and I think that's that will be a, a real value in, in, in what this study is kind of shown is to try to avoid disengagement. So th throughout the study, you, you were looking at the disengagement, but I'm sure you came up against um, some teachers who were using techniques quite positively to get positive behaviours from the students. I, I know it might it wasn't necessarily reported in the uh, research project, but what what teacher behaviour did you see which was more deemed more positive by, by the students? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I mean, one of the get out of the hind or sorry the the way the study developed was I spent a lot of time in the classrooms talking to teachers talking to the students and um there was some really really excellent teaching um the so some of the things that I thought was really valuable um some some teachers really explained the relevance and why why they were learning certain doing certain activities what the students were going to get out of that why it was important to the students and they really spent a lot of time emphasizing the, the relevance and the value of 
every activity and why that was being learned. And that really helps in terms of not feeling students to be forced to do something in class. It's not just a case of the teacher saying, do this because I say so. It's they're really explaining why, the, why it's beneficial, what the relevance is, so that the students can think, oh, yes, I, I, I see this. I want to do this. This is, this is valuable to me. Um, also, asking students' opinions and actually sort of if, if a student's struggling and voices that they're struggling, it, 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 taking that on board and really thinking, well, okay, that, that's, that's acceptable. You know, it, everyone learns at different speeds. So if someone is struggling, it's important to then you know, address that and, and how can we relate that a bit more to that student in a way that they're going to understand and get that message across. Um, and, and also in terms of guiding students, some teachers were very good at not just guiding students in terms of what work needs to be done in terms of this essay or, or this, this assignment, but they were very good at also guiding students on how to complete that. And when we think about ability, it's not just about guiding students on this work needs to be done. It's giving them strategies to also be able to do that work as well as they can. Um, and so the teachers that were kind of using that, were, I mean, they were very, very, you could see from the, you know, the, the students really engaged with, with those kind of behaviors. And there's, there's also been a lot of research done on those kind of strategies that's, that's emphasized the value in that. As the, the, con of, uh, the, the consequences of psychological pressures is, is very important and you've clearly demonstrated that. So how, how do you think teachers can be trained to be aware of the psychological pressures that they may be initiating in the classroom? And what can current teachers do to reduce the negative consequences of any of these psychological pressures? Y yes, uh, um, the, following the research in, in this area, there's a lot of interventions, a lot of uh, workshops being done with teachers to to look at the positive behaviours and, and, and what they can do to, to engage students. But there actually is very little that's been done in terms of actually making teachers aware of the negative consequences and how to avoid disengagement. And, and, and that's something I'm really wanting to do in my current and future research is really try and work with, with teachers around um, making them more aware of, 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 the, of psychological control. Um, I used an example earlier about potentially giving them some, uh, giving teachers scenario, giving teachers scenarios where you know they're, they're dealing with different types of disengaged disengagement and getting them to become more aware of what might cause that and how they might respond to that disengagement so for instance if 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 there are you know very dis actively dis disruptive uh, pupils in a classroom you know it, it can be very easy under a lot of pressure just to kind of say right do this or you you get in detention and it's kind of just being aware, getting teachers to become more aware that that kind of response might have a negative impact. It might make them more disruptive, more disengaged, more active. Um, and so, yeah, for, for me, the, the study is really trying to bring an awareness of, of these interactions and psych or psychological control to the forefront of, of people's minds so they're aware of it and they know then how to respond in a in a way that isn't pressurizing and it's sort of the student experience, the student perspective, rather than just dealing with the, the disengaged behavior. It's kind of dealing with the cause more than the actual behavior, if that makes any sense. But I, I, would, I would certainly, as I go forward, I'd like to do a lot of sort of workshops with teachers to sort of explain this. And so when, when they are d faced with disengagement in a the classroom, they're a bit more prepared or have a bit more understanding of specific reasons for different types of disengagement and how they might respond in that situation because teachers have a you know have a you know very difficult job in terms of the, the pressures they have the curriculums they've got the, the large classrooms that they've they, they teach you in so if if this study can help teachers in any way um then that, that would be brilliant do you think there's any correlation with the transition from primary and how um, the te you know teenagers are developing um, physiologically as well, or do you th do you, are other factors going on here? Um, there could be. So one um, one of the things we controlled for in the study was uh, different different classroom subject. Um, so and we found that you know regardless of the subject, these associations maintained the same. Um, so kids that were unable to do the work were passive and those that felt forced to do um, activities in classroom were active or, or passive but th there equally could be um, we you know learning difficulties might play a part in it um, from a theoretical perspective um, 
there's been a lot of research looked at similar associations, not so much on disengagement, but the, um, motivation in general. And they were found to be universal across all different cultures, um, different socioeconomic backgrounds. So uh, this study is really just looking at the general associations that when a, an individual teenager feels unable to do the work, they will, you know, respond in a, in a passive way. Um, but respond in a, in a passive way. Um, but certainly, the, 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 as, as teenagers de develop, um, there could be influences there that influence these, um, these disengagement responses. Um, and uh, another study that I'm looking to put together is a longitudinal study off the back of this study, where we can actually monitor disengagement across a number of years and, and actually see if changes in teenagers' psychological experiences linked to changes in their disengagement. Um, and and when, when you start doing longitudinal work, you can actually start looking at really, you know, factors that might influence that change. Um, but there might be other, by all means, there might be other factors that are going on um, and, and, and could add, add to these findings. A fascinating area and insights. Uh, thanks to Dr. Stephen Earle from the University of Kent in England. And you can read more about the research by following the link in the... Hey, teachers, classrooms are important, but sometimes you need to think outside the walls to get the best for your children. Outdoors, children learn faster, they play harder, they develop quicker, and they grow up happier and healthier. That's why thousands of teachers around the world are getting outdoors on the 18th of May for Outdoor Classroom Day. Will you dare to play and learn outdoors? Go to outdoorclassroomday.org.uk and register your class or whole school today. Welcome back. For many teachers, the art of differentiating lessons is a troublesome and time-consuming task. Well, what if I was to tell you that it was a phrase coined into pedagogical terms only in the 1990s? Our regular commentator, author and teacher Richard Rogers in Thailand now shares some of his favourite classroom ideas to ensure successful differentiation. Studying my PGCE way back in 2005, I wasn't expecting my first lecture to be all about this new alien concept of differentiation. My bachelor's degree was in molecular biology, so differentiation to me meant cells specialising to become nerve cells, red blood cells, whatever kind of specialised cell they would become. What I learned later, however, is that educational differentiation means when teachers specialise their teaching methodologies to meet the needs of their learners. Here's the best definition of, differ definition of differentiation I could find. Differentiation refers to a wide variety of teaching techniques and lesson adaptations that educators use to instruct a diverse group of students with diverse learning needs in the same course, classroom or learning environment. The basic idea is that the primary educational objectives, making sure all students master essential knowledge, concepts and skills, remain the same for every student but teachers may use different instructional methods to help students meet those expectations. I will now describe the top in instructional methods that I use when I am teaching my students and differentiating for my learners. Number one, styles tables. Have information presented in a wide variety of ways and placed on different tables. For example, one table, might game. One table might contain auditory information in the form of MP3s, in the form of dictation machines, in the form of CDs, in the form of a computer that's linked to an audio file. Also, you could have a table that has visual information, written information. Another table may have kinesthetic information where the students have to build a model or play games or create a game. 
Um, another table might have information presented in picture form only, and the students have to figure out what the pictures mean. Second technique is delegated responsibility. This is where you split groups into ability. For example, when analysing a poem, a low ability group might be asked to describe the meaning of the poem, whereas a high ability group may be asked to suggest ways in which form and structure emphasise the meaning of the poem. The, same, the objective is to get all the groups to tackle the same task but using a different level of methodology that suits their needs. Finally is the technique of student teachers. In this technique, you get students to take ownership for part of a lesson and do some of the teaching themselves. Give basic instructions about what the content is and maybe some ideas about how they can deliver the content, but don't give them too many ideas. Let them come up with this themselves. Students are always very, very creative when they perform this kind of task. Thanks, Richard. Richard published a comprehensive list of differentiation classroom ideas on the UK EdChat website recently, and we've added a link to this within the show notes. Oh, and also, we've created an online course on differentiation for teachers, and you can find this at ukedacademy. Well, that's about it for the show. Thanks for all the feedback we're getting. Please subscribe via your favourite podcast smartphone app or on iTunes, and you can contact us via podcast at ukedchat.com or via direct message on Twitter. Thanks to Stephen and Richard for appearing in this show, and until next time, goodbye. <laughs>